be on the panel tonight. GP and former AMA President Mukesh Hakawal, who's been on the front line of the COVID response from the beginning. Broadcaster and author Michelle Laurie, who co-hosts the Australian True Crime podcast. Radio broadcaster and a man of many opinions, Steve Price. Senior economist Alison Pennington. And from lockdown in Sydney, epidemiologist Mary Louise McClaws. Please make them all very welcome. You can stream us live on iview and all the socials. Quanda is the hashtag. So please join the debate and let us know what you're thinking and how you're feeling at this very strange moment. Our first question comes from Tejas Balaraman. Do you guys feel like New South Wales has really learned from the mistakes Victoria made last year and incorporated that into their response? Let's go around the panel in answer to that question about learning from the Victorian experience. Alison, what do you reckon? Absolutely not. I think... Uh... From an economic perspective, some of the key implement, things that were implemented by the Victorian government to get out of our wave have not been observed, uh, have not been implemented at all. Um, we're talking the need to actually intervene into normal business operations and actually uh, instill something a bit stronger to actually you know, reduce output sometimes, reduce numbers of staff that are on site, uh, instill hospital grade PPE with, uh, in, in very high risk, high transmission environments. Um, what the Victorian government did to get out of, uh, to pull us through the last wave was to actually, uh, you know, code every industry and workplace with a risk transmission um, setting. And so high risk environments were shut down. That's what it means to shut down non-essential businesses. And then environments that were high risk but essential, things like abattoirs, um, read, uh, like wholesaling, cleaning, the things that actually keep our, us all going in a time of lockdown, they had quite strict requirements to make sure all their staff were kept safe. Uh, and, you know, coming out of the lockdown, there was also compliance measures. So when businesses had to be part of the compliance uh, schedule, it wasn't just put onto individuals. And we see with, with Gladys's a lot of her... Um, you know, her framing is this consistent f falling back onto individual responsibility and common sense, but the government isn't actually doing the hard work of confronting their most vocal constituents, which are the business community, um, and doing the hard work of crawling into the business f fabric and uh, instilling a more, you know, a, a healthier way that we can move through this trans... Uh, to diminish transmission and to... But yeah, isn't this government. beyond... It absolutely wasn't smooth sailing, and I think yes. um, we saw that with some of the treatment of minority communities. Absolutely. And, uh, there was a massive debate and discussion about how those things could have been done better. Could we send in busloads of nurses into the towers, the social housing towers, before we sent in the police, right? Yeah. And these were logistical questions because yeah. it was like a wartime mobilisation. Well, and I think, like, in, in workplaces as well, it wasn't smooth sailing. Like, there were employers that were still forcing workers to go yeah. to work where there were outbreaks mm -hmm. and they weren't disclosing who had, um, who, was, who had the outbreak, how many people. Mm -hmm. And so workers actually had to take upon themselves to work together in spotless cleaning, in uh, toll retailing, and actually close the, the sites down to, to make sure they were oh, Just to jump in there, yeah. Mukesh. Let's go to our next question. It's a video from Fox and Thomas Mulder, truly. Hello, my partner and I are casual workers in disability care. We have lost our income due to the lockdown. The $600 per week from the government is not enough. If I had worked these 20 hours, I would have earned $1,100. My question to the panel is how do I make up this shortfall of $500 per week when I have to pay all my outgoing living expenses? Let's go to Alison on that. It's a question for you. There's absolutely no reason why those payments can't be livable payments, right? If we, we have to accept, if there's one lesson we can take collectively as a nation through the pandemic and even the, the federal budget's coming on the other side, hundreds of billions of dollars have gone out the door for all sorts of things, mm. stuff we needed to keep everyone afloat, keep businesses afloat, but also things like $18 billion a year on tax cuts for we very wealthy people, right? So we've got plenty of money. Why do we choose? Why are choices being made at a federal government level and, in this case, New South Wales state government, to chastise people who are already in low-paid professions uh, and in some of the most important work, frontline work, caring for others, like in disability care, um, and why wouldn't we extend to them the payments that are required to, to get by? And why would we instill this sort of level of precarity and insecurity on people? The point is we don't have to. Um, the, this package that's been crafted with Commonwealth support for and with the New South Wales government uh, has been done with something in mind, and it is in mind to ensure that people on uh, the welfare payments also do not get a scrap, right? So it, it, 
makes sure that there's something like 200,000 people in New South Wales who are on a welfare payment but derive income from their work. They can't get any of these, these, uh, those payments. So that's, these are people even in a worse position than, mm. than um, our... Well, the federal government would say, you know, we don't have a bottomless pit of money. I mean, JobKeeper uh, cost us billions. And I think the federal government thought that we were going to get through that and JobKeeper would finish and we wouldn't have any more outbreaks. And so what they've suddenly got is this outbreak in New South Wales and they've had to work out, well, we, we're going to have to help the, the vulnerable here. But what they've they had did... a head-butting exercise with New South Wales. No. Originally, the feds didn't want to give any money. Well, yeah, of course. And then they were brought over because of the fact that Gladys had become... But a... how, how, much we, how often are we going to do this? Every yeah, time we've got a breakout... Can I finish your point? Because yeah. the point is that... JobKeeper was... The government was dragged, kicking and screaming to JobKeeper. That wasn't Morrison's position. They wanted to put everyone onto unemployment benefits. So there was a... It was the work of the ACTU and other organisations that pulled the government to a position of a wage subsidy. They pulled down JobKeeper way too early, as well as the coronavirus supplement, which gave people above-poverty existences. Millions of people. It lifted 400,000 people out of poverty, the biggest poverty-raising measure um, that we've ever had in history. And uh, they were pulled down unnecessarily. This package comes now two weeks into their... Uh, two weeks too late. And it's because they had to re recook up all of the policy. They pulled down all the architecture, had to remake it, and they've, they've rebaked it and they've redevised it in a way that's um, more unfair and leaves people like our, our questioner in a worse position. And also they've been cutting funding to social services for 20 years and you can't do that and then have an international crisis pop up and expect so something to happen, expect social services then to pick up the slack. There are none. There are no services for low-income people in Australia. There are no services. Fair, fair go. Government has given increased access to mental health consultations and psychology services, which is great. Um, and there was the, the, the job keeper, and whether it ended too early, we understand that. I, I think we have thought it's all going to go away and it's all going to be rosy now, and it's not. So it's actually okay to say, look, we got the timing wrong, maybe we should think about this again. But, Makesh, can I ask you, who thought it was all rosy? Because I, wait, months back when they pulled down job keeper and job seeker and said, it's all done now, the pandemic's yeah. over. There were, I was sh screaming and shouting that those policy architecture had to re remain in place yeah. because we were not free. Yeah. And I'm sure the healthcare sector I, said the that's same That's exactly thing. right. We, we've been... Since the bushfires, actually. Remember those? So we've had another crisis before that, since the bushfires. Yeah, fire. exactly. Before we move on, um, Steve, I just wanted to get a quick reflection from you, quickly, if I can. What did you make of the war of words between the Victorian government and the federal government over New South Wales getting preferential treatment? The feds deny that that's the case. I mean, I think if you go back to the original long lockdown in Victoria, the federal support was there and there has been a lot of money spent in Victoria. I just wish that state governments and federal governments, no matter what political colour, would get over the parochialism and just get on with it. I mean, come up with the solutions. I what, mean, you want a federation or something? Well, there's petty, <laughs> stupid arguments about, you know, who got more and who didn't. I mean, just let, let's move on from that. I don't think that helps anybody. Very quickly, Alison, is it a petty argument? Does it matter? It does insofar as... Uh, this is something like a wartime mobilisation that we're living through. And if you've been left out on your ass, which is what happened to Victoria, there's, there's hurt feelings. Like, there's a businesses that lost millions, millions more than businesses will lose in New South Wales. That creates an uncompetitive environment. There are individuals that were left without income, casual workers who were sacked in Victoria that had no income, whereas in New South Wales they will. But in terms of moving beyond this, I think it is upon us to, you know, recognise that the Federation is being pulled apart um, in a really serious way. Since it formed, this is probably the biggest test it's ever been through, it, and I it think is. that it's upon us to reach across our state divides and, and yeah. um, express solidarity with each other. It's a very different kind of federation. Let's go to our next question. It comes from our audience member here, Nick Murdoch. In an attempt to promote vaccination and stay-at-home orders, the federal government recently released a shocking new ad campaign depicting a young woman gasping for air whilst attached to a ventilator. However... The vast majority of those under 40 are ineligible for a vaccine due to an apparent lack of supply. Young Australians like myself are now seeing our fully vaccinated friends overseas getting back to normal while we are still living in and out of lockdowns. Why did the Morrison government spend taxpayer dollars to produce an advertisement featuring the wrong demographic and not one promoting the benefits of vaccination instead? Well, we've got two young women on the panel here, I yeah. guess, who are... Yeah, you'll yeah. take that age discount yeah. too. Yeah. Who I guess this, uh, this ad was aimed at. Alison, did it work for you? It is, like, 
if there was, it was possible for Morrison to gaslight anymore. <laughs> like, that is like the upper limit of it. Right? It's like, <laughs> it's, um, I mean, even talking of like the fatigue of lockdowns, I can't entertain <sighs> that when like, everyone's made huge sacrifices, but until I have something in my arm and an opportunity to access that vaccine, um, I won't, I can't entertain that lockdowns are gonna, you know, these have to end because we can, we do it and we save lives doing it. Um, I first seeing that ad, uh, distressed, and I thought, why is the federal government, there we go, why is the federal government, uh, why is it trying to instill deep fear in people? It has not given us a public health campaign since the pandemic hit 18 months in. Uh, I grew up in a time of slip, slop, slap and, you know, big public health campaigns that you can do them when you actually want to achieve, you know, public health outcomes. What this ad for me is doing is achieving, distilling fear. It's, it's deepening fear and I think this is very typical of the way the federal government's politics are shaped. It's not concerned about uh, bringing people together, of which all of the research shows that um, messages of solidarity and take, make this sacrifice because it's for the good of everyone. If you look at everyone else's ads internationally, smiling faces, people coming together, the sacrifices we made, we're all better off together. And we've got that. And it features a young woman, a young person who can't even access the bloody vaccine. I mean, it's... It's a bad ad, but I, I mean, I think it's unfair to say that uh, Scott Morrison is trying to deliberately somehow gaslight people. I mean... He uh, hasn't had a great record in his career of producing great ads. We all remember Lara Bingle, and that didn't work that well either. But <laughs> the federal government w would genuinely be trying to come up with some way to get more people to get vaccinated. Oh, you just that don't get us millennials, ad. Steve. You don't get us. <laughs> <laughs> OK, Michelle, no, actually, honestly, explain the millennial point yeah, of view on this, then. <laughs> no, but honestly, I, I, will, I will confess to my age, because I am struggling to care about this issue, Steve, I have to admit, because I... Just think this whole story about how old the lady in the ad is is such a kind of um, typical. And I, I'm, go, I'm going outside. Say it. You've had I'm your going outside, no, You've but, had but, your but I'm going outside of Australia again, and I'm saying, look, it's just a very um, privileged kind of argument to be having. I think you know, fly two hours north of Darwin, and and land in Indonesia. And do you think anyone cares about how old the lady in the ad is? Like. We're so lucky in this country, and if that is honestly the most important thing that we can talk about, I know it's not the most important thing, I, I, and I, I'm sorry, and I know you, it's, it's gaslighting and all of that, but, um, but I think, gosh, we are really lucky in Australia. Can I... I'll try another but, but, angle but, for but you. But can I just finish what I... I just yeah. want to... On, my, my reaction to that is that, you know, in Indonesia they're running out of oxygen, and the money that was spent on that ad would have bought a lot of oxygen. For so you're saying the advertising campaigns, it doesn't matter what I they come up with. I, I couldn't care less. Can I couldn't care less about the lady in yeah, the no, go on. I, want to hear from, I want to hear from Steve again. I think he was cut off, so, um, which rarely happens. But I, Alison, I'm, I'm, I'm being very polite. He's flanked. He's flanked. I'm being very polite. I think it's like deeply offensive to say that people concerned about um, a virus that's killing millions of people... And no, don't have an ad. Yeah, but the fact they got the, the point of the context of the ad is that we don't have any vaccines. That's the context of the ad, and that matters. And so, I will take away the word gaslighting because it's something that you didn't. No, like. no. It's, but how I about I use the word lowering expectations? Because if if we look at that and we say this is okay, everything that's going on right now in this deep crisis-ridden country of this deep political crisis and this health crisis, and this is okay. For me, that's not okay. And I think that's part of being in a democracy, part of lifting expectations, and about looking out across Australia and saying like. We can do better than this. It doesn't make us privileged. You know, we can sit back and be like, it's great that we're not... Like, we are saving people's lives right now. But the reason why we're doing that is because Australians believe in the public healthcare system and they believe that we can make sacrifices to save each other's we're lives. We're lucky to have a public health care I, system. I want, to, I want to come to Mary Louise McCaws. Mary Louise, I'll come to you. But can I just quickly say, for the record, I think it's important because, you know, everyone's having a red-hot go at the advertising campaign here. We did work very hard to try and get a member of the federal government on the panel this evening, including, we asked, Greg Hunt, Barnaby Joyce, Jane Hume, Bridget McKenzie, David Gillespie, number available to us. I understand we will have one next week, which is terrific. But just so that position is represented, they're not excluded, they just weren't able to come. Um, but speaking of sex, and I've always wanted to say that on this show, <laughs> the next question is on video from Emma Pierce. Hi panel, thanks for taking my question. So I am currently in Sydney in the extended lockdown and I live alone and I don't have a partner. So my question to you this evening is, 
do you think that the government should create a single bubble? They seem to say that it's okay if you have a partner to come over for intimacy. Uh, so I feel it's a bit silly that you can have someone that you might have met for six months over for sex, but you can't have your friend of 14 years over for a socially distanced dinner. I'm really interested to know what you think. Thank you. Mukesh? I don't think so. I, I mean, if you've got someone... You, 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 other countries have created bubbles with one other person. It doesn't have to be your intimate partner. And this is a, a wonderful idea. Um, you know, the people were doing great things on Zoom, for instance, over the, the lockdown. My own you know, 8 year old 80-year-old mother was doing dance classes on, on that, which actually kept them going through that awful time. Mm. And that kept them fit. And these are the sorts of things that people have done, which we've forgotten about. We've learned these sorts of things about mm. social outreach, about connections which people need. We're human beings. We need to touch, feel and talk to people. But see, all Mikesh, the time. didn't we go through this in Victoria and there was a, the first two-thirds of the lockdown was the guidelines were significant intimate partners only. And I think there was a yeah. lot of pressure and people mobilised to say... Why does it have to be this type of relationship? And I think it did open up to significant people and I think it sounds like New South Wales needs to do the same thing. I think it's really crook of us to be giving Sydney a hard time and saying, oh, you didn't learn from our lessons. It's like you were saying, it took us a lot of hard learning and I think it's unfair of us to be criticising them for not learning. I really do. We, we... It's fun, though. We're talking about the government, not people. But even, yeah. like, I, I get that. Policy I do understand that. I do understand people. that. But it, it, yeah. it's hard. I mean, they, they are populist leaders, our leaders today, and that sucks. And I, I don't approve of that. But that is the way that we have, frankly, trained them to be. That is who we vote for now, and that is all we vote for. We don't vote for leadership. We vote for people who pander to us consistently. That is what we vote for in this country, and that is what we've got. And so Mate. that is how they behave. They don't want to lock down. They don't want to do the right thing. They don't want to do the smart thing. They don't want to be leaders. They want to do the popular thing I... every single time, and that's what we voted for. OK, and that's let's hear from Alison. Yeah. Well, we democratically elect leaders, and yeah, so I know. Part, these discussions are part of pointing to um, obligations on government, yep. especially in a time of a great crisis, to uh, make decisions that are in the interest of people long-term, their health, well-being, the economy long-term. And so um, I, I absolutely understand, like, the point you're making about this era of populism. I think what's been really remarkable about this time is it's been a... The states have kind of come forward again as this... Uh, you know, the last bastions, really, of social democracy and, yeah. like... The, the welfare state and public health care. And I think, actually, Australians are really rallying around states because they can see that they're providing... Well, on, on that score, Raquel Garcia in the audience has our last question this evening. Hi, I'd like to present you with a fantasy scenario. If you were handed the top leadership position to get us through and out of this um, pandemic devoid of politics, media bias and avoidable factors that have seen Australia in the situation that we're in right now, how you, would you do it? All right, so one great idea each from our panellists to get us out of this mess. Alison? Uh, I think the pandemic has shone a light on the scourge of insecure work in Australia and they've insecure workers not knowing when they're going to have their pay week to week are having to turn out, rain or shine, sickness or not, and um, put money on, bills on, uh, food on the table. I would say uh, strengthen our industrial relations laws to allow casual workers to have more permanency, have sick leave so they can stay home. It's going to help us get through the pandemic and um, allow them to come together in the workplace and advocate for better, better wages and conditions so they can power themselves to push COVID out of the workplace as well as have income security to, to get through. Bottom 20% uh, uh, get nothing. They're really unfair tax cuts. People want to see much stronger action from the government when it comes to climate change. It's no coincidence that we have a wages crisis in Australia. Transitioning to net zero emissions, it doesn't seem like there's much room for gas.